James, welcome to the show. Glad to have you on. Let the audience know what you're up to, and then let's dive into, uh, it sounds like you've got some great best practices for people. Well, it's great to be here, David. I'm thrilled to be on your show. Good. So talk to me about what you're doing with your company, and you've been at it a long time, and where you're at, the whole type of thing. Yeah. So uh, Tech Commandos has been around 22 years, and uh, you know, kind of started as that traditional IT firm helping small and medium-sized businesses with all their IT needs, whether it's that and new computers, set up the network, do their security, et cetera. And over the years, um, starting about 2004, we started doing a uh, application hosting in a data center. And then it grew and became actually a full desktop back in 2014. And now we kind of like next gen the whole MSP idea by providing a totally online service for all your IT needs. Okay. So um, basically, I guess, you know, we have a lot of people in the audience that do that same type of thing. So what I'm kind of curious about is where you have found ways to really save time. Maybe is my bigger thing, even more than saving money. I, I realize cloud stuff and, and what you're doing can save money, make it a lot faster, easier. But whether, what about you as a leader? What do you do to stay focused with all this stuff going on and really you know, hold yourself accountable that you're doing what's most important day in and day out? Yeah, so I think there are several tools and tactics. I mean, first of all, I will tell everybody this, is that um, I've probably dug into every time management system there is. And I finally came to the understanding that actually it needs to be James's time management system. And that all of us need to figure out the very best pieces of certain systems and bring them all together. And so, um, you know, one of the things is, is that, you know, today can be a very distracting moment uh, working between you know, a send and receive automatically going off and suddenly you got 25 emails sitting there staring at you and distracting you or, you know, using some sort of instant messaging, whether it be Slack or Teams. And so one of the things is I would say predominantly or most importantly is that I try to chunk my time and some of that needs to be private time for the best thinking and knowing to do the right things. I just like will take two hours and say specifically, this is me working on this project and with no distraction. I would say that was number one. I'd say a second That's great. One, so stay, stay with that for a moment because I, I, I recommend that same thing. I call it sanctuary time. Other people call it time blocking, you know, different things. How often do you do that? Sure. So one thing that I'm really cognizant of, and everybody, this is kind of goes my whole thing about, you know, figure out your own rhythm to things, is that I'm an early morning person. So if you will, I love that sanctuary time piece is that I find early morning. So I have to wake up very early, like 5 a.m. I've got a little routine I do between 5 and about 7. But I know that my most productive time, the time James can be the very best for his company, is early in the morning. So that is when I will take and put those hours. And so my folks know coming around 11 o'clock, you can easily get hold of me to get in deep with whatever you're working on. But that early morning stuff, that's James' sanctuary time. Hey, you know, you brought up a huge point. I want to make sure that the audience really hears that. And, and you're telling us it works, and I know it does, is that you not only do the sanctuary time where you have no interruptions, but you schedule it at the time of day that you do your best work. So it's brilliant that you're doing that because, uh, you know, people sometimes do that and they're like, okay, I'll schedule that like at the end of the day. Number one, they don't always get to it, or most of the time they don't get to it. And number two, they're worn out. You know, at the end of the day, it's not when they're going to do their best work. Do you do that five days a week or just several several times? I actually do it seven days a week. So <laughs> even no, because our, first of all, our business runs 724, 365, but I do try to take my weekends with my family. But I've got two boys and a wife that I've had for almost 30 years. And you know, that may have framed it kind of wrong saying I've I have, but we've shared a relationship. Um, but uh, you know, one of the things is I want to make sure that I know I'm at my best early in the morning. So, like, if I can spend time with my boys and doing things, and my wife, I try to get it done then because I kind of I'm not a late night person, first of all, and some people are, and sometimes there are people that think that's their ultimate time. Like, you know, as soon as like the business kind of shuts down at six, seven, eight o'clock. Their best hours are those hours. That's not for James. That may be for somebody else. And yeah, just yeah. trying to, I guess, experiment 
figure out. I mean, I'm, I'm 56 years old now, and I'll be upfront with you, still tooling with the machine, trying to figure it out. And I think that the biggest lesson I ever learned was is that you got to make it your own thing and try new things to figure out what the right thing is. Well, I, I, if I heard you right, I really like what you're saying, that you're keeping that in mind as far as your best time of day when you shift over into the personal relationships too, because at the end of the day, that's really what we got left. So I, I interrupted you or you were mentioning this one thing. So I'm kind of curious, you got this sanctuary time where you're really focused doing probably strategic work as well as maybe some tactical work, but how, how do you make certain you're focused on what's most important? So somebody, and I'm not taking credit for this, you know, I've just, I've read this on several people as a, you know, as a business owner, and even as a personal individual, even if you were working for another person or a company, is what are the high dollar items? What is going to move the needle? And I think if you can come to the premise of what moves the needle and take that and put it in your, your sanctuary time and that chunk, then you're going to be much more likely to get it done. Because, you know, in some ways, and I don't totally agree with this ex second thing, is that some people are like, well, you only get three, three, three things done in a day. I don't think that's totally true. Um, three important things. But, you know, what are the most important things? And focus on the things that can move a needle, whether it be, you know, an improvement to your company from a system standpoint, whether it is this is that big deal I need to get, or it's the big project that needs to get started. And then I need to get the ball rolling so that my team can get behind me and push the rock up the hill and up and over and get the job done. Yeah. So, so I'm curious, one of the things that you're, you're alluding to, but haven't mentioned is, so how do you engage with your direct reports? How often are you meeting with them and what do those meetings look like? Yeah. So things have changed a little bit. Um, so pre COVID, so here we are in 2022, but pre COVID, we had a lot more we'll called improv type meetings. We had a team meeting, but now my entire company is completely remote. And obviously our company sort of rings of that with what we do. So it was no problem to become remote workforce. But what we do is we have a standing one hour meeting every week. And as the owner of the company, what I try to do is um, I do come in with an agenda on the very beginning of it to say, hey, look, you know, these are the big items going on. This is things of concern. And then as sort of a second part, I go round robin with the entire team and have them bring up any major issues. And they know that my management style personally is I take nothing personal. This is all about our customers and us getting revenue and, you know, fulfilling what we need to for our own families as far as, you know, a payroll and paychecks and getting our bills paid. And so um, everyone really takes it to heart because I will upfront, if somebody tells me something that a customer were to say something about one of our team, I'll do it in private, but they know I'm coming to talk to them about it. I don't hide anything, hold any back. But so the second part is everyone kind of gets to say their thing. And then the thing that I learned with the whole COVID thing is there's a third part of the meeting where I'll just say, I'll come up and I'll just say, everybody has to chime in with something they did really fun last weekend. Or, you know, there was a recent holiday. Tell us a funny story real quick. Try to keep it less than three minutes. Because the culture part of the business where you socialize is kind of evaporated. And I try to bring it into those meetings. Um, as far as the, that was a total team meeting. And, uh, but at direct report levels, um, probably once a day, Ollie will chime in and I normally, right at the beginning of shift, will say, what can we do? So I happen to work with my wife in this company and she's part of it. And sometimes we, we own more than one company. So sometimes we're not totally into this company. And we'll, I will say, what is it that we need to do for you? So I'm just like servant to, you know, like a servant would, what can I do to take care of it? So a little long winded there, but that's what we're up to. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's really powerful that you're showing the, you know, kind of what can I do for you type of thing to engage with them um, because they want to feel valued. And so have you ever had something come up where you said, what can I do for you? And the request was something you, you couldn't do or didn't feel was consistent where it, it, it was just out there or something like that? So sort of. <laughs> so we give you a quick story. It has to do with COVID. I had a long time employee, about five years with us. And um, he came to me in my office, funny enough, 
in a weird way on my birthday and uh, said, listen, I, I just found out I got cancer. Went, Whoa. Okay. So I happen to know the exact type of cancer and happened to do the same thing my mom had passed away from. So I understood it. And his name was Steve and he's still alive, which is great. But um, the years progresses prior to COVID. But when COVID came around, he got really sick. And at this point, we had departed from the office and he had to go on long-term disability. And I had a choice. I could have we kind of ignored him after that, right? He's no longer productive to us, but I kept in touch, even though I knew there was no way he was going to be able to come back. And he ended up getting himself into a really tough situation um, where he ended up in the hospital and no one was helping him. And he was leaving the hospital to go to rehab. Um, he sadly was unable to walk at this point. Um, the good news is he's walking now, but no one was there for him. And my wife and I, uh, you know, dug deep as good people and did a lot of really good things for him. I mean, he had literally no clothing, nothing other than what he traveled to in the hospital. So we ran to Costco, did a big Costco run on his behalf for some food that he probably shouldn't be eating, like little treats. Um, <laughs> but uh, we got him. Uh, I ended up getting a computer, a tablet, a Kindle, uh, and, and everything from underwear to socks, to the basics. And uh, it was COVID and um, it was in the winter. And uh, I went to the rehab facility. I couldn't see him. I kind of realized I wouldn't be able to see him, but they literally made me leave it in a container outside of their building for 24 hours before they were even able to give it to him. And then on top of one last little piece was he kind of hadn't handled his finances right because he was in the hospital for almost 30 days. It was like 45 days. Uh, I took care of his mortgage, some other things. And so, you know, I think sometimes people will not do those things. I had no gain other than my own knowing I was doing the right thing. My, my parents were good. They taught me right. It was expensive, but it was well worth it. And, you know, now he's, he's a better place than he was before. You know, yeah. you can mention the story. So, <laughs> well, and, and I think what that, what that points out is that um, the, I think one of the key things was that you stayed in touch. You know, when it when it went south, as you mentioned, there was no business value in in staying in touch and staying connected. But there was a personal one that was consistent with your personal values and probably your company values. And in the end, you you and your wife decided to take that to the next level. It sounds like quietly in the background, it wasn't anything you told anybody about. You just went out and did. And um and I think that, that that speaks a lot. And I want to encourage our audience that we get so busy in our professional lives and our personal lives. It's the relationships that count. And, you know, these people that leave and um, here, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things about life, right, James, where we go through certain things and we're like, why do I have to go through this? Like your mother, if I heard you correctly, your mother had the same type of cancer. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that was probably hell. And uh, my, my brother had leukemia for 13 years before he died and, uh, of it. And uh, he had five good years during the, the first year was hell. And then the next five years, he went on a different drug. It actually healed him for five years. But then that was it. And the last seven were really hard. But, uh, you know, you go through these tough times and then you get to then. It's funny how life works you then run into people who've been through the same thing and you can help them. So I think that's great that you did. I think that's a great statement about, it's funny. We were just talking about what, what, how do you stay focused on what's most important? And in all honesty, that was a really important rock to deal it, with because yeah. he'd been with me. I mean, you know, yes, he was an employee and sometimes as business owners, you know, it's, it can be a tough relationship. It's a very mental game being a business owner. But, you know, he gave me five very solid years and he was a human being that just needed some help. And that's what's important. And, yeah. you know, I'm sure there will be people that disagree with me and that's OK. You know, it was a personal choice, but it is, you know, it is such a mental game playing in the work in the in the arena of business. And it kind of to roll it back to the habits and some of the things you do. It's being very cognizant of that you've got to be flexible and a learning individual and not get rigid about things because usually you get rigid in my mind and I'm not a go, go lucky kind of guy, but 
I'm actually a pretty serious guy, but you got to be able to kind of just ebb and flow through your business life and your personal life because sometimes they're good days and sometimes they're bad days. I think that really what you're going to find with the audience that we have on this podcast, no one's going to disagree with you. Everyone's going to not only agree, but they're probably thinking, yeah, I would do that because we have good people on this podcast. We, we really do. And these are people that care and are trying to be better like what you're saying. Let me go back to this piece, though, because I really appreciate your candor, James, of how you're focusing on what's most important. So how do you where do you keep that that list? I mean, there's so many tools now, whether it's OneNote or I don't know, Slack teams, blah, 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 you know, thousands of things. And yet I do, you know, I've got one person I coach who's a young guy and, and you would think this wouldn't happen with a young guy. He still uses a handwritten notebook. Uh, but what, what do you do to kind of zero yourself in on what's most important? Okay. So I'm going to confess slightly. I am a one note guy. I like one note, um, but I'll be very upfront with you. I am still a paper pen kind of guy. And I know it's going to sound silly as I will take a white piece of paper, turn it sideways, hold it. And if you will, that represents four days. And I realize there are more than four days, but, and I'll write Monday on top. And I have like these little sections I write schedule and I'll write down what my schedule for the day is. Yes. I could have looked at Outlook. I could have looked at our CRM, but just writing it down is a great reminder of me of the things that are about to happen. The next one is I'll write to-dos. If there's some little mini projects, I'll put them there. I have another area I write projects, and the last one is voicemail. And those four things compress what usually a day for me is. And I know it sounds kind of crazy. It's on a piece of paper with all our cool technology, but that old school thing is still working with me. So, so what's voicemail? So voicemail, yeah, what's voicemail? Um, you know, if somebody were to call me, I don't. So I've really learned with voicemail not to call back that instant. So almost like chasing the email, we, we tend to see the 25 emails come in. I got to look at the 25 emails and voicemail can do the same. I try, you know, this goes back to like pushing back on time a little bit and saying, I got to work through and get these things done is that I try to stop the things that are trying to gain my attention until it's ready time to do it. So I've sort of heard people say, oh, you know, three times a day, check your voicemail, check your email, and that's it. You know, I try, I try to do that um, best <laughs> I can. So, so you've got, you've got four sides to the piece of paper. So are you doing, you know, Monday on one side, et cetera, or what, what are you doing? Yeah. So it's, it's each section. So if you fold a piece of paper, you'd have four little sections. Each section represents a day in those days. I have these four sections being schedule, to do, projects, and voicemail. Um, okay. Obviously, there's still things like email. I we use Teams, uh, very similar to Slack. You know, to chat back and forth. The good news is we've learned as a team we don't necessarily have to react to everything on on the chat because it you know it's weird. These technologies are phenomenal, David. Phenomenal. And I've been a little technologist since I was a little kid. I was a guy breaking things apart and putting them back together and having a great time. But the, the, the sucking sound that email, voicemail, <laughs> teams can do to your day, it disrupts it, which leads us back to where we were before, that, that special time that you've got to block off, sanctuary time, is so critical because you can't get it done otherwise. Yeah, well, you know, as much as it, you're pointing out a... Uh, somewhat of a flaw that the way you're folding the paper is four days when you got five work days. I actually think it's great. I block off my Fridays on my calendar. So nobody can book anything on Friday unless I allow it. And so in a, in a similar way, by taking your Monday through Thursday, I throw this out for the audience. If you're really zeroed in focused on Monday through Thursday, then, and you keep your Fridays blocked off, then you can do Friday as a catch-up day. You can do Friday as a special projects day, you know, whatever. I find it's a real pressure relief that I go into tomorrow and I've only got one call I have to do tomorrow because we're recording this on a Thursday because that's the only time that client can meet is Fridays that's at that time. Otherwise, I only, so then I've got all this time to do all this project stuff and strategic stuff 
Yeah, that that's a great yeah. hack. That's that's a phenomenal hack. And actually, I might steal that one with you <laughs> and start using it. Um, you know, I, I guess you know the, the 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 big moral of the story today is that never ever before in the history of man have there been so many distractions. Whether it be the Netflix, the binge watching, and I'm not saying these are bad things to do. There are times that you got to just sit there and watch a cartoon and just like blah out and not have to worry about it. But on the reverse of that, if you don't take control of your time, I guess, you know, and this is going to sound cliche, but if you don't take control of your time, someone will absolutely take control of your time. And that's the real, the real moral of the story. And everyone works differently. I think that's another really good nugget. But you've got to figure out your way to do your very best work. Yeah. And I think you brought up a really good point. I'm going to go back to this. Um, I'm going to use my term of sanctuary time of the 9 to 11 my impression is, so I talk to leaders, I recommend this type of thing all the time, but my impression is, James, that you're probably accomplishing significant things week in and week out because you're being very disciplined in that time and you've communicated to your team, hey, don't contact me between 9 and 11. Just leave me alone so I can get stuff done for you for clients and, and then I'll emerge and and can help you but am i right are you finding that's been a big game changer for you yeah it, it absolutely has i mean you know one of the things i alluded to a little earlier is you know i certainly have tech commandos and that's you know a big piece of what we do but we also own commercial real estate and we've got several projects and it just happens to be right now we're selling one building and that's you know going through a negotiation and so that's sucking time and the, the, the thing that I think is most important is, is that we all want to accomplish so much. You just got to figure out what you're trying to accomplish and, and chase that down. Those are the, you know, I'm going to steal something from Stephen Covey and, and I, and, you know, his book on the seven habits, one of them, I believe was to take the big rocks, the big things that are most important and get them, if you will, in the jar first. Um, and then put little smaller pieces in all the way down to the point with a little minute sand. And I remember years ago, I watched a video, he's since passed, but many years ago, um, where he literally demonstrated the difference. If you don't put the big rocks in, they're never going to get in. If you already put small stuff in first, you'll never get the big stuff in. And um, it, was a, it was a good illustration of just, you know, get the, what's most important and focus on it. Yeah. So um, I don't know who did that first. I, I think when I read it, it was a professor. And I think there's some different videos out there, but I, the way I originally heard it was a professor walked up in front of his class and he had some type of jar, glass jar. And um, so he put in golf, golf balls and then he put in pebbles and then he put in sand. And then he put in like two cups of coffee or something like that. And so then he said, and he said, like, what's the point I'm making? And that was, and then he walked through, I'm saying by memory, just like you did, the big things were the important things. And that was the golf balls. And if you put in the pebbles or the sand first, the golf balls won't fit. And then the pebbles were, you know, the things that were important, but not urgent or, or whatever it is. Um, boom, boom, boom. And then the sand was the other things you have to do. And then the class said, well, what's with the coffee? He said, oh, well, you always have to make certain you save time for coffee with a friend. <laughs> I, I like the last part. I'm a big, big coffee drinker myself. And uh, yeah, it is really important. And I think that, you know, one of the things is, is that it's so much more, it's more than just business, right? It could be your yeah. family. It could be a friend in need. It yeah. could be a lot of things that are those big rocks. And I guess becoming, you know, more self-aware of the most important things and, and running with those, you know, they're the ones that are going to move the needle, right? What, whether that needle is just your own personal fulfillment, whether that is a revenue kind of needle goal, but you know, what's it going to take to move the needle is what I think. And, you know, I've got lots of things and lots of vendors trying to chase me down for meetings and lots of cool new tech ideas. And I have to be careful about, uh, one thing we haven't really talked about, which is the uh, shiny object syndrome. 
Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Yes, where the shiny object gets in the way. <laughs> and uh, especially as business owners or anyone looking to succeed, you know, try to further themselves and succeed, you know, it, there's a lot of that distraction as well. And so I happen to be, I, I've, I've tamed myself over the years, but I would look at the shiny thing and try to chase it. Like right now, it might be like, you know, I am not chasing it, but cryptocurrency, right? And, you know, I, I, I'm just like, nope, not going to even look at it. Don't even want to go down that little <laughs> rabbit hole, you know, and uh, but there is that shiny object syndrome that yeah. happens to all of us. No, and, and I think really it's very interesting to do this, have this conversation because we're going back to some real basics. But one of the biggest challenges the leaders have is where do I find time? And what you've outlined are some very simple tips where you've been able to create time. You, you are spending your sanctuary time. So you're really focusing on what's most important. You have your folded piece of paper. So you're writing things out. And one of the things we didn't mention, but science has actually shown that when you hand write something, it connects with your brain much better than typing. So when I'm trying to memorize things, like if I'm memorizing a Bible verse, I write it out on an index card, very old school, but that's the way I memorize. You know, so so if you do that type of thing, now I do have a question for you too. You mentioned a few times you work with your wife. Yes, I think that's a blessing that you're able to do that. But but in what ways do you find that your wife helps you maintain focus on what's most important, or helps you slow down, or helps you avoid that shiny object syndrome? Yeah. So um, I read this many years ago. And whether you're a Bill Gates fan or not, they were talking to him about his management style. And I came away from actually two things, one that applies to my wife, one that absolutely doesn't. But the one that does apply to my wife was, he said to the interviewer, he says, I will, this, at this point, Steve Ballmer was in the company and was his second in command. I will tell him everything I'm working on and turn and say to him, does this seem like the logical things and the most important things we should work on? I do a very similar thing with my wife, where if either I feel overwhelmed or it's like, am I making the right decisions? If I blow this off and work on this instead, does that seem like the logical thing to do? And I will turn to her and say, listen, these are all the things that are on my radar right now. These are the priorities, you know, the first, second, third, fourth thing that needs to get done. Do you think I have this correct? And there have been times she's turned to me and said, no, I think you need to flip this over. That's got a bigger importance. This has a long-term value to us. And, and I would just say that, you know, in my, my wife's name's Cherry. So the good news is Steve Ballmer, because he's a wild man. Yeah. Uh, have you ever seen him? Uh, I'd be scary to be that, married to him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd be scary. <laughs> he's, he's great. I mean, he's got a lot of energy. And I actually had the actually privilege a long time ago to meet him and Bill Gates before, like they were at crazy wealth levels. Yeah, yeah. And he was just nuts. Up. The energy just, just flows off him. But the beauty of it is, is I think the lesson that I'm trying to, to establish here is it could be your wife. It could be a good friend. It could be a business colleague. I mean, you still have to be careful. Maybe it's something you don't want to reveal to a business colleague, but getting someone to be humble enough to, with yourself, to let somebody see in and say, yeah, I think you got it right or you don't have it right and challenge you as to why you don't have it right. That's where my wife just brings incredible value. And as I always say, she's always cleaning up my messes um, <laughs> in the sense of uh, she does all the finances for the company. I'm the visionary, the one that comes up with the idea of how we're making money. And I, I love it. I mean, it's like a great puzzle for me. Unfortunately, the puzzle makes a lot of mess and she cleans it up. So that's, I would say, the biggest thing she brings to a while that I love her dearly. And I've owned multiple businesses with her. So, I mean, we've had this business for 22 years. And we certainly have our real estate, commercial real estate enterprise as well. But way back when we were younger, we owned two restaurants. So you can only imagine that chaos. <laughs> and um, But she has been a great check balance. So I would just say, if you can find that, it's a good thing to do and use. No, I, I think you bring up a, an excellent point there. And I think the key thing that makes that work beyond both people have integrity is that there has to be respect by each individual of the other person's strengths and quite frankly, their weaknesses. 
It's like, based on what you described, your wife respects the fact that you're the visionary, you're going to charge ahead, but you're going to struggle with the detail side. But she doesn't get bitter about that. She doesn't put you down about that. She doesn't harp on that. She's like, that's okay. That, I, I know that about James. Okay. But he's a good man. And I know I can trust him. And in the same regard, where, where those times where she says, you need to slow down or you need to stop, you don't blow it off and, and, and get bitter and just like, oh, you just want to slow everything down or, oh, you want to take too long or whatever. You show her the respect of saying, that's right. I, I know you're saying that. I, I trust you. You know, I can slow this down a little bit. I know that from my past. I may feel like I got to do it or I'm going to miss out. But there's trust and respect. And so you can do that. I love the way you brought up. It's great to have it in a spouse, but it may be in someone else. You know, it's not of the opposite gender where you're going to get too close to that person, I will add. But it is with, you know, someone who can be a mentor, a business partner, uh, whatever it might be. Um, and I think that's business, wonderful. Yeah. The best business partnerships. I mean, and I am in a business partnership with my wife. You, you gotta be, you know, take the ego, throw it out, get the emotions out of the room. And, you know, my wife is, I, I don't know, she's, she's, she is more emotional than I am. And, you know, we have to balance off each other and, 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 and work together. You know, we're going down the same path and, um, and trying to achieve the same goals. And it's even, you know, as I said, you know, it might be a reflection on exactly what I'm doing, but it's also even a big picture, you know, like, you know, on the real estate, should we buy this building? Should we sell that? And the business is like, oh, I found another revenue stream. I think we should do a little skunk works, test it out. If we can make, you know, $5,000 a month off this, I think we should try to scale and see if we can do $50,000 a month off of it. And, you know, and she's been very supportive and I've been very fortunate. In fact, you know, as we, talked earlier about the morphosis of this company, I credit her um, to allowing it to happen because when I started on this reoccurring revenue stream, which is what, in all honesty, the real reason I did the application hosting and I did the desktop hosting is because it, it changes the valuation of your business and it also changes a lot of problems with cash flow because we're charging every month. And as long as you pay, you're using it um, very much like a health membership. But those changes came about with her saying, yeah, do it. And I mean, when I say back in 2004, we were selling our first deal and it was an extra $35, $35 a month. It was like a one user deal. And then I, <laughs> and literally what I did is I built the reoccurring revenue over the years, first to cover the expenses. Then I covered my employees payroll, not ours, but theirs. And then eventually I got it up and over and it was above us and you know, and I morphed the entire business. Now we're 98%, if not 99% of it is all this reoccurring revenue. And um, it's because I had a great partner that was willing to deal with seeing the vision, but, you know, being there at those infant stages and watch the infant stumble, make mistakes and get back up and keep running. Well, well James, this, this has been a great discussion. What I'd like to do in closing out is I'd like you to tell the audience, you know, where your business is located. We haven't mentioned that. It'll be in the notes. And if they want to get a hold of you, either to learn more about what you're doing at Tech Commandos, or they want to take you up on what you've suggested of, hey, let's go out for a coffee at one of a, hopefully a local coffee shop, maybe not one of the big brands, but one of those ones that have a unique flair with their decorating, whatever, and just kick back and get to know one another, compare leadership notes or whatever it might be. How would they get a hold of you, learn more about you? Sure. So uh, funny enough, I happen to be just moving to Florida. So we're, my wife and I are moving to Daytona, Florida. Um, as I, our company is very virtual, so we don't really have offices anymore. But I will always have a virtual cup of coffee with anyone. <laughs> and uh, one of the things is, as you mentioned, how to get hold of us. What I've done is I've made a special web page about Manage to Win. So if you go to techcommandos.com forward slash manage to win, I've got a little extra video on there, as well as a way to get hold of me even personally. There's a link to get right into my schedule. I'd be more than willing to talk to anybody about pretty much anything. And, um, you know, obviously, if it has anything to do with what we're doing, that's awesome. 
There's some additional links there for more information about what we do, which is this cloud desktop application hosting. And, uh, you know, we're there for your viewers and, and hearing what they have to, you know, their challenges. And if I can help in a way and serve them and help them make their lives better as a business, we're all in. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, James. I've enjoyed the conversation. I think it's great for the audience to hear. We're four months in almost here into this year. And uh, I think you gave some great tips on how to get better focused and, and manage your time, create some time. So thanks again. Thank you, David. And have a great 2022 and a great 2022 to, the, and to your viewership. Thank you.